Another episode of Words of Grace starts now. Featuring a new, grace-filled message each week as Acts 433 Church brings the gospel to you through the teaching ministry of Dr. Matthew Webster. Hello everyone, it's great to be with you today. As we get into God's Word, we're going to be introduced into something that is so important for us to pray about. And as we do, we're assured that God is going to give it to us. And in fact, the very thing that we pray for is essential in making disciples. And as we pray, we're going to be prepared to receive the yes answer that God is going to give us. So we're going to go together into two verses, uh, starting in Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Now, some manuscripts say 70, others say 72. I'm going to stick with 70, and that will be clear why as we progress moving forward. But if you want to go with 72, that's fine as well. Okay, so there are so many things that are going on here. Jesus just sent out 70 individuals to every place that he was about to go. Now, the word others here is very important. It comes from the Greek word, it's derived from the Greek word heteros, and it, it means others of a different kind. And so what this tells us is this isn't 58 plus the original 12. These are 70 different disciples of Jesus. The original 12 are not included in who Jesus is sending out at this point. So earlier in the series, I said that we are going, we are called to go and make disciples. And I said, Jesus doesn't say go and make 12 disciples. Well, we could even extend it out here because some people think we should follow Jesus's model in every single aspect. Well, Jesus actually sent out 70. So, you know, you're not called to go and make 70 disciples, at least not most of us. Uh, well, at least not at the same time. After this, the Lord appointed 70 other of his disciples and sent them two by two. So they went out in pairs. And I cannot stress this enough, how powerful and important it is to do ministry together for many, many reasons. So why would Jesus send them out in pairs? Well, it provided the four C's. The four C's uh, would be courage, companionship, credibility, and also cover. Paul would write to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 13, 1, that every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So when somebody tells you something, especially something that is just so incredible, well, how about like, the news the Messiah that has been waited upon for centuries has finally come, and you can see him. And you can look at other things, like you could share the miracles that you have witnessed that, that Jesus has done. Uh, and you can say, well, Pastor Matt, that was 2,000 years ago. Well, Jesus is working miracles in your life. Are you aware of them? Are you sharing them with others? And the thing is, if you went ahead and said, this miraculous thing happened in my life, or come and see the Messiah yourself, people would go, ah, I don't know about that. But when you have another person who is with you, well, now you've got something. It's not just one person who's sharing the good news. It's multiple people together. And so it becomes very much more credible and believable. Uh, I also witnessed the miracle. You see, chances of you reacting to a single person telling you such great news uh, is, is slim. What is it? April Fool's Day? But with two, there is credibility. I better check this out. Could he be the Messiah? And the same thing that happened some 2,000 years ago uh, can happen today as you go out and you minister with other people. Could Jesus be the Messiah? It, is it true? You received a miracle in Jesus' name. 
Also, when you are together on mission, it gives you courage. You're not alone. You have someone that is there with you, someone to pray with, someone to encourage you. And you are emboldened to speak and share the gospel because you have the support of another person who is with you. There's also the building of companionship through the adventure that ministry brings. And I can tell you that ministry is an adventure. You never know what's going to happen. And you have these shared experiences with others. And then when they would gather together as a congregation and they would share what the Lord had done in their lives, uh, it would spur on other people to go and to get involved in ministry, and maybe even join them on the journey, the companionship of doing ministry together. And so also going out on mission can be dangerous when you find yourself uh, maybe in a new area all by yourself. So together you are safer. There is protection and cover because back then there would be robbers, still robbers today, as people traverse the highways and the byways. And so Jesus sent them out two by two for those four C's. Now sending this group, what it did is it provided an extension of his ministry. Jesus' crucifixion was fast approaching, and the sending of the 70 was critical. Uh, Dumlo wrote that he wished to train his followers to act alone uh, after his departure. So he's getting them ready because he's not going to be with them uh, forever. Well, he will. He'll, he'll be with them to the end of the age, but not physically on earth with them. And it's significant that Jesus commanded such a large group of men on such a mission. It indicated the power his ministry had already generated. Jesus would go ahead and follow up their visits by personally going to all those places that he sent the 70. So why did Jesus send 70 uh, and, and not 72? At least that's my take on it. Some translations will read 72. But the number, the reason I, I land on 70 is the number that he sent out on mission has spiritual and symbolic overtones, and this is why I believe it was 70 and not 72. The Jews held that the Gentiles were made up of 70 nations, and at their Feast of Tabernacles that they did every year, they had 70 bullocks that were offered on behalf of the Gentile nations to make atonement for them. The cities and the places to which these 70 were dispatched was in the Transjordan. This is where the Gentile population predominated. And so Jesus sending 70 was a sign that the gospel was to be for all people. The Gentiles as well as the Jews and the Samaritans. Jesus sent out 70 and it seemed like a lot. But Jesus said... The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, Jesus doesn't give us a Debbie Downer moment. There's so much kingdom work to be done. There's not enough workers. Woe is me. How will we ever be able to accomplish this mission? No, Jesus gives us the answer when there is so much kingdom work to be done and there are seemingly not enough people engaged in disciple making. And it comes in the second part of this, of this verse that I read just a moment ago. There is a shortage of laborers and there's a lot of people to reach and the answer is, Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Praying, Lord, send out workers to your harvest. It's just the kind of prayer that builds a harvest interest within the one who prays it. If you will pray this prayer, it will change you. And if you pray this prayer, I promise that you will see incredible things start to unfold in your life. 
Because when we pray this way, our hearts are now focused on the kingdom. When we pray this way, we are actively seeking and expecting the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. Imagine praying for God our Father to send us more kingdom laborers and then believing that he will. And then being ready when he does to disciple those he sends us. There was an old survey that was done back in the day. Uh, it was a time before there was cell phones and, the, and before people, most people had the internet. And kids still played outside and had to come home when the streetlights came on. Uh, and even in that day, which is surprising, the survey that was taken found that 72% of Americans do not know their neighbors. I wonder what it's like today. We think of being sent out to make disciples as meaning to go to the ends of the earth. And, of course, that is part of the calling. Uh, but that's, that's what God is calling certain individuals. We talked about this before. Apostles to send out one's missionaries. Uh, but we also, as apostles, have a mission field. Our neighbors, our friends, our family members. And so, uh, more often than not, we're called to the person who lives next door. We are planted where we're at to bloom and to blossom and to bless those around us as we partake in kingdom work. Do we know our neighbors? And I'm not say, asking that question to put guilt or condemnation on you. I'm just saying there's an opportunity. Do you know your neighbors? And if not, well, get to know them. <laughs> because there's an opportunity there to build relationships and to have opportunities to let our light shine. One of the most powerful ways that more laborers are sent is to pray for them. But also for us, to bring the miracle-working power of Jesus Christ into their world. Check this out. Just a few verses later, in verse 9, Jesus said to the 70, And heal the sick there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. Well, how did the kingdom of God come near to them? Because the 70 brought the kingdom of God to them. And he did, they did that as they prayed for the people and they healed them. And the power of Jesus Christ was on display. In other words, Jesus anointed the 12 and then the 70 to preach God's word and heal the sick. Now today, if you want refreshment, if you want health and healing... Don't sit under church ministries that tell you that God doesn't always want to heal and that he sometimes gives you diseases to teach you lessons. Instead, sit under anointed ministries that preach the good news of healing the sick in Jesus' name. That is how you can begin to walk in divine health. And I promise you that we will continue at Acts 4.33 Church to preach the good news of the gospel and the fact that healing is available in Jesus' name. And this is how more and more people will be added unto the kingdom. And more and more people will begin to grow in their faith and be involved in God's supernatural work of disciple making. Believing in Jesus and doing the works that he did. In fact, Jesus told us that we would do these works and greater works than he did, because there's going to be a, a number of us engaged in it, and that excites me. If you are a believer in Jesus, that's what your life is. Your works, your life, it is a display of the trustworthiness of Jesus. And then we also find as a bonus, I love this, it gets even better, as a bonus in the text, we find that kingdom work is not joyless. The 70 returned with joy and said, Lord, 
even the demons submit to us in your name. Your kingdom work will be a joyful work. That's Luke 10, 17. Fritz Kreisler, the world-famous violinist, earned a fortune with his concerts and compositions, but he generously gave away most of his wealth. And so when he discovered an exquisite violin on one of his trips, he didn't have enough money to buy it. He had that violin in the back of his mind. And so he saved up, and later, having raised enough money to meet the asking price, he returned to the seller, hoping to be able to purchase this beautiful instrument. But to his great dismay, it had been sold to another collector. So he went and he visited this, this new uh, owner, and he had in the back of his mind he was probably going to have to pay more for it. The collector said it had become his prized possession, and he would not sell it. Now, keenly disappointed, Chrysler was about to leave when he had an idea. Could I play the instrument once more before it's consigned to silence, he asked. Permission was granted, and the great virtuoso filled the room with such heart-moving music that the collector's emotions were deeply stirred. I have no right to keep that to myself, he exclaimed. It's yours, Mr. Chrysler. Take it to the world and let people hear it. Christ in you is beautiful. You just have to share the beauty of Christ with the world. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It is about getting before others and letting your light shine. That's why Jesus sent the 70 out, bringing the kingdom of God near to the people who were far away and lost. So finally, as we are praying for God to send kingdom workers, we also need to be wise with the time that we have ourselves. Don't waste time in places that are not receptive to receiving the gospel, but be willing to stay where the gospel begins to take root. The first part, when we should stay, is found in Luke 10, verses 5 through 7. When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. And culturally, what is happening is this is normal back then, to lodge with strangers and to eat a meal on your, uh, on your traveling journeys. There wasn't Motel 6s, Hilton Hotels. People had to open up their homes. And what a perfect opportunity this was to share the gospel as you shared a meal together with someone else. Now, I wouldn't recommend staying in a stranger's home today. That's not the point here. Staying uh, in our day means to continue investing time in the relationship cultivating it, and sharing more and more of Jesus in their life. And even though we're 2,000 years into the future, i got to tell you that breaking bread together, sharing a meal, is still a very powerful way for us to get to know them better, to listen to what is happening in the world, and to bring the kingdom near, to share the gospel. And so... We are, if they are receptive to it, we should stay and we should invest time into that relationship. 
So who should I disciple? Well, those who are receptive to the gospel. The order of the mustard seed, uh, founded by Count Zizendorf, you gotta love that name, Count Zizendorf, uh, he had three, only three guiding principles. Be kind to all people, seek their welfare, and win them to Christ. So, uh, and, I, and I love that. May that be guiding principles in our lives as well. But the next question is, well, when should we move on? When should we uh, stop pursuing trying to disciple someone, stop trying to share the gospel with them? Well, Luke chapter 10, verses 10 through 11, uh, gives us the answer. When you, when you enter a town and are not welcome... Go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Charles Spurgeon said, it is our business to proclaim it, speaking of the gospel, and leave it. We've proclaimed it, we've done our job, leave it. The responsibility of receiving or rejecting the gospel, it rests with our hearers. I love this quote because it takes away any pride where we realize that salvation is a work of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's John 3.3. 3. That is, if a man is not born from above by a work of God, he cannot be saved. No one has the power to raise himself from spiritual death. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day, John 6, 44. And so R.C. Sproul said this, he says, The response of the sinner is not dependent upon the messenger or the methods he or she employs. It takes all the stress off of us. It's not about us. If we bring the gospel... We can leave it there with them. It's up to them and how they respond. And it's a work of God through the Holy Spirit. It's not about the methods that we employ. And that's what this series has taught. God has wired you a certain way. He's gifted you in a certain uh, form and fashion. And so it's not formulaic. It's organic. And it's God working through us. And so we don't try to copy how someone else does it. We simply share the good news uh, and, and we teach people what Jesus taught us. And it's not us who brings salvation. Uh, we bring the kingdom near, but it's up to the hearer in how they respond. So may you be blessed in knowing that as you pray for God to send you disciples, He will. <laughs> he will. And there is great anticipation that He is sending someone to you that you yourself are uh, gifted in such a way, positioned at this time in your life, that you can effectively uh, disciple them. And so, God is sending you someone that you can help grow in their faith by teaching them what Jesus has taught you, what you have learned in the Word. And so, also, move on when someone is not receptive to the gospel. Be willing to invest time in those who are. And look forward to the work that God is calling you forward into because kingdom work, it is a joy. And it is something that you don't have to do alone. Jesus sent them out in pairs. And so maybe there's someone else that you know who's a believer. And together you could do the work of discipling people, bringing the kingdom into someone else's world. Uh, you could even start with a little small group Bible study or join one and invite someone. There's a lot of ways that you can do this. You can always, as I always say this, invite someone to watch the message, share this message online, and uh, find more encouragement at wordsofgrace.tv. And I just wanted to say blessings to you and I want to say thank you for your work in supporting the building of the kingdom of God. And so let's go ahead and finish our time off together praying 
now for God to send laborers into the harvest field. There are many people. The harvest is ready. There are many people who are ready to receive Jesus. So let's go and let's share him with the world. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message. How important it is for us to pray for more laborers to be sent into the harvest field. I know that as we get closer and closer to the end days, there's more and more darkness in the world, but the light shines brighter and brighter, and people are receptive to receiving the gospel. We've got to bring the kingdom to them because they're not going to just one day set foot in a church. Not very often. We have to meet them where they're at, in the workplace, in their homes, uh, and, and bring forth the amazing announcement that salvation is made available to them in Jesus Christ our Lord. And a lot of times that is done through healing. And it's done through the miracle working power of Jesus. And that's why Jesus told the 70 to heal. Heal in His name. And we are called to do the same. Lord, I pray that we will just take a moment out in our day to reflect on the miracles that we have experienced. And the opportunities we have to share what God is doing in our lives. We can do that through social media. We can do that as we encounter other people. People who are going through something are looking for others who have experienced the same type of thing. That we might testify what God did for us and being with us on the journey. So Lord, I know that there are certain people that we are called to reach because we have experienced similar, similar things. May we have our eyes open. May we be ready to respond. And may we look for others to do this work together. May we be excited that as we pray for more laborers, that you are sending people to our path, that you are calling us to disciple. And we know that kingdom work is a joy. There's nothing more joyful than seeing people receive miracles in Jesus' name and being added to the kingdom. We celebrate your work in our lives. We celebrate what you're moving us forward into. We anticipate and expect by faith that you are going to do some amazing things through our lives. We give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise in Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. The more time you spend in God's Word, the more clearly you'll discover the grand calling in your life and how you are key to sharing the good news of Jesus with the world. When you partner with Acts 433 Church, you're taking the love of Jesus and the gospel of grace into homes everywhere. Real lives are transformed by the love of Jesus and because of your faithful generosity. Your financial gift can be given at acts433.com and will support the advancement of the good news of Jesus Christ. Join us today and together, let's make an eternal impact.